Hi, everyone. I'm Sean Waldman with CS Cyber. I'm Chad Robinson. And that's the CS piece. Today, we're going to talk about the CrowdStrike. Uh, is it an incident? <laughs> Is it an it issue? It certainly was. I don't know. Uh, the uh, CrowdStrike incident on Friday. Uh, to just talk a little bit more about kind of what happened and uh, you know what we can do moving forward. We've also got a special guest. We've got James Fisher with us. Uh, James is our director of cyber operations uh, here at Secure Cyber, and uh, he's uh, going to bring a perspective. Uh, James manages our EDR platform. We do not use CrowdStrike uh, here, so we didn't have the sleep issue that a lot of people had on Friday. Um, we use Ford EDR, which is a, a, a different version. So uh, let's just start going right into it. Um, first of all, let's I'll kind of kick it off and just talk a little bit about kind of what happened and what we know about so far. Um, CrowdStrike is indicating that a quality control issue uh, was to blame uh, they are currently indicating that there was a file, a driver that was corrupt or bad, referencing memory that didn't exist, uh, which then uh, caused the uh, endpoint to go into a boot loop, uh, basically. Uh, blue screen of death, boot looping. Uh, there were issues with uh, BitLocker that, that started appearing. People were realizing that the remediation steps that, that CrowdStrike were providing uh, were not as easy as, as said. Uh, I think a lot of organizations were realizing that a physical access was going to be required. That's just crazy. That's just every one of these had to be touched. That's yeah. just insane. Especially right. with work from home. Yeah, right. Well, I, I mean, the pictures really said a lot, right? We saw a lot of pictures from airports and, you know, uh, malls and, and things where... <laughs> Everybody realized, uh, one, who CrowdStrike was pretty quickly um, and the number of devices that were impacted. Um, so just a, some st statistics that we have so far, um, there were over 31,000 flight delays. Um, so there was a huge uh, global ground stop. Uh, so uh, we haven't seen stuff like that since 9-11, uh, that, that type of uh, stoppage. Um, from what I was seeing, uh, Southwest Airlines and Alaska were the two <laughs> that were still operational, obviously not using the Windows architecture, <laughs> the current one at least, um, as much as they, uh, as much as everyone else was, uh, 3,500 cancellations that day. Um, and that's just a minimum, uh, financial services, payment card systems, pharmacies couldn't, uh, dispense medication, uh, hospitals and healthcare. So there was a lot of disruption to that industry, mass transit, uh, DMVs. Uh, and in this area, we had a lot of 911 issues. Uh, so a lot of 911 centers uh, were dependent on that. So what went wrong? I, it, for me, honestly, it seems like there was some sort of auto update and there was no change control and everything just rolled out and everybody got the patch all at once. And it for me, it seems like everybody that uses CrowdStrike, that's their best practice, which from my experience, auto updating anything is not best practice. You got to have that layer of control and to have uh, like a ring approach where you can roll it out in a test environment before you roll out everything into production. And it really felt like everything went directly into production. So uh, this is terrifying because CrowdStrike, uh, from what the research that I've done and, and some of the people that I know technically that have looked at this has said that within like 10 to 20 desktops of testing this, they were all blue screening. How could something like this go like this? It just seems like it's really just an operational error. I mm -hmm. mean, it's just a lack of control that that CrowdStrike just rolled this. I mean, that's, it seems hard to believe for a company that size. Right. Yeah. That's, I think that's the thing that surprised me the most. Um, CrowdStrike is, uh, you know, been very vocal about Chinese threat actors. Um, that's the thing that w worries me the most is that uh, while they say that this was not a cyber I attack, um, that it was just a plain quality control issue, I, I still can't wrap my head around an organization of that magnitude um, just slipping a update out. Right. I mean, it may have not been a cyber attack, but it definitely identified a uh, a potential viable path to initiate a cyber attack. Absolutely. You take down somebody that's a huge market player like that. And now you've impacted how many global systems 
and now they know who uses all those systems because of who went down from the recent outage. Yeah, that's one of the things I think that worries me the most is um, the number of threat actors that know who has EDR, Mm -hmm. uh, CrowdStrike EDR. Um, And uh, so the auto-update thing really surprises me. Um, Auto-updates is is obviously... uh, you know, a dangerous thing. Um, we see it in smaller organizations for sure, um, w- which makes a little bit more sense. But when you're talking about Delta and American Airlines and, and some of these major organizations, it just really surprises me that, um, and, and even with some of the compliance standards that are out there like SOC 2, um, you know, could we possibly be seeing deviations in compliance by allowing a vendor that much direct access into an, in an environment. And what about like file integrity monitoring? I mean, is, is that something like from a compliance, I know you manage some of the SOC 2 pieces. Yeah, well, I'm kind of thinking of this. I mean, are they doing just, just, an, just an auto update of, it wasn't like, it was a collector group, right? It was the actual EDR agent. It was on the was, endpoint. Yeah. Right. So the actual program itself, right? Yeah. yeah. So I see a lot of times, I mean, it, it's kind of like Windows updates, right? I mean, a lot of people will have those automatically turned on, automatically updating if they have a smaller IT shop or right. um, they just don't have the resources to do it. And we see that a lot with Microsoft, right? We see a lot of blue screens, not a lot, but they've gotten better over the years. But, right. you know, historically they've had that problem. It, it seems like, if you have that turned on for all of your applications, do you really have any control over your environment, right? Like what is just just happening? There's a lot of changes happening all the time that you're not aware of. Right. I know when, whenever we do any updates with EDR, we always try and push out notifications so at least you're aware of what has changed inside your environment because sometimes that's the hardest part. You come in Monday morning, everything's offline, and nobody changed anything, but somebody changed something. Right. Well, and I, and I think this is a continuous issue that we're seeing with third parties, um, whether it's Snowflake, right, and, um, and saying, well, you know, Snowflake's taking care of my security for me. No, they're not, right? You're, they're providing you a platform, but you're responsible. Um, and, and really the same could be said with CrowdStrike or any software provider. Well, I'm just going to let them, right? It's, it's CrowdStrike's responsibility. I trust them. You know, they've got quality control. You know, what could possibly go wrong? Yeah. And th- I mean, this may be something like how fundamentally EDR interacts differently with the operating system than the old school antivirus, right? A lot of people like think EDR and antivirus are just kind of the same thing, but... Yeah, they are not. They are not, right? I mean, it's totally different than just getting your antivirus definition updates and yeah. going about your day. So this has to really be a controlled deployment, and I think that's kind of how we do it. Maybe you can talk a little bit about how. Yeah, yeah even, we- even with change control, that's one of the things that we talk about. If somebody's implementing a new change inside their environment, that we have to know that because EDR will block those changes, even if it's a new IT process or whatever. That needs to be part of your change control process because EDR is so much more aggressive than the traditional products. You have to think about that when you're rolling out new things. And we're not, um, just from a secure cyber perspective, we're not rolling out collector updates as often as Fortinet is placing them, right? No. And we always update our environment first to try and mitigate those things. Obviously, we don't have the same configuration setups and applications as everyone, but we start with us and then roll it out to other areas to test, interact with everybody so that they're aware of what's going on, and then solicit that feedback frequently to make sure that if there is something that's happening, that we can stop that progression if there is a problem so uh one of the uh byproducts of an incident like this is obviously threat actors taking advantage of the situation so uh we already have a report now of it looks like over about two dozen uh fake domains uh that are likely going to be used for phishing Uh, so threat actors are going to be sending emails out um, indicating that they can help with the remediation uh those types of things using these fake domains uh, so, James, how, how, do, how should operators or, you know, protectors use that information? Uh, anytime information comes out, you have to figure out what's actionable, whether or not you can block the domains, uh, and even internally putting out a memo to your internal team so they know what the response is officially from your team so that it cuts down on that, all those issues. It's like the, the fog of war when something like this is going on. You have to clearly communicate so everybody in your team knows how your team is handling that and what that response is. And then when you do have those indicators, what actions can you take with those? 
Can you block the domains? Can you add them to a threat feed? What can you do? And making sure that your team knows what to do to report those because there'll be other domains that pop up that aren't on those lists. It's, I think it's definitely a security awareness, you know, product uh, issue where, um, you know, even if your provider for security awareness doesn't have the ability to produce a video that fast, um, that it's on you, right? It's, it's, it's on you to develop that communication and get that information out to your end users and let them know that this is a threat. Right. And it's also a good time to dust off your uh, incident response plan, even if it's not a security related incident. I mean... James and I were kind of talking about this earlier, like just knowing what you're going to do in a situation like this, right? Who the key players are, who the decision makers are, what's going to be your kind of your rally point and your your next step, right? So. Absolutely. You have to get all those key decision makers in a room and then you have to be able to be flexible and ad hoc things because there's going to be things that come up that you didn't anticipate. Somebody's not there. The system or service is no longer available. And what are your mission critical services? Because sometimes those even change between the last time you had your plan updated you've implemented a cloud infrastructure or whatever else, so you have to be flexible. So at least two recommendations then. One, if you were involved in this and you have CrowdStrike, um, certainly you know, making sure that post-incident that you're debriefing uh, to go over lessons learned for sure. Um, and if you were lucky enough to not have CrowdStrike like we were, um, and we talked about this as a team this morning uh, when we came in, about making sure that um, we tabletop this maybe ahead of time and say, what if this would have been ours? Mm -hmm. How would we have responded? Um, James, you and I were talking a little bit about the, just the public relations piece of this alone. Um, you know, certainly CrowdStrike, um, you know, on the, on the plus side, you know, from a brand recognition standpoint, everybody knows the brand now. But on the, on the other side of that coin, um, you know, there's some reputation hit. So CrowdStrike's really got to figure out right now how they're going to respond to the PR piece of it. Um, and I can't even possibly imagine the amount of lawsuits uh, that will fly uh, by organizations trying to recover, right, the financial downtime. Yeah. And that's there, going to be huge. Yeah, there is a dollars to downtime. And, you know, it, it is hard if you're in – now they're a household name like Kleenex in a way that they didn't want to be. Right. Yep, Certainly. All right. Uh, well, that's all we have uh, time for today. So hopefully our audience was uh, able to you know, get some perspective on the CrowdStrike issue. Um, and certainly if we have more information that comes forward, you know, we'll definitely re kind of regroup. Um, maybe even after the final report is out and we have the opportunity to look at that, maybe we can provide our comments. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks, Absolutely. James, for, uh, for coming in. We appreciate your insights. Thank you for having me. All right, that's it for today. Thank you uh, for our viewership, and thank you for who listens to the podcast. Uh, this has been a special episode to cover the CrowdStrike uh, issue, and uh, we look forward to uh, talking to you later on uh, further episodes. See you next time. Thanks.